So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com on May 16, 2008. Run for your lives. Hide the women and children. There's a 10-cent plague loose upon this fine land. My guest today, David Haydu, is the author of a new book that, at the very least, probably has the best title of the year, The Ten-Cent Plague, The Great Comic Book Scare, and How It Changed America. In this book, Haydu looks back at a hysterical period in American history, one of many, to be sure, when comic books were considered such a threat to our way of life that the industry nearly vanished. Haydu is also the author of Lush Life, a biography of Billy Strayhorn, and Positively Fourth Street, the, live, the Lives and Times of Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, Mimi Baez Farina, and Richard Farina. He teaches at the Graduate School of Journalism, at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, pardon me, with another friend of the Mr. Media Podcast, Sri Srinivasan, and is the music critic for the New Republic. Now, unfortunately, I have to admit, uh, David's not here yet. <laughs> I don't know where he is. Um, but while we wait for him, I have, uh, I have an excerpt from his book that I'm going to share, and we will hope that when I finish, David will magically appear on the phone line. So this is an excerpt from The Ten Cent Play, The Great Comic Book Scare, and How It Changed America. Harry A. Chesler, Jr., the comic book packager, applied the junior to his name or dispensed with it as he saw fit and put quotation marks around the initial because he thought they were stylistically correct. And he was right about that. When he was asked what the A stood for, he said, anything. Indiscrimination was his middle name. Stubby and gray-skinned, he dressed in striped shirts and a suit vest that often, but not always, matched the pants. He kept a derby laid flat atop his head all day indoors. And he was usually smoking a cigar, proportionately stubby and also gray, with the label intact a fancy label that could impress anyone who did not know much about cigars. Chesler, a stickler for efficiency, minimized the creative effort required of his artist to render him in caricature. He set up his studio in a long, open workspace, last used by a wholesaler of buttons and zippers for the garment trade, on the fourth floor of 276 Fifth Avenue, a 10-story, half-block long building north of 29th Street. Chesler filled the room with rows of used desks which were cheaper than drawing tables, and he lured over the shop as if it were a gangland fiefdom. Anyone arriving at work five minutes late would be docked an hour's wages. And on payday, he would sit behind the desk in his office, summon the artists one by one, and ask each of them, how much do you need this week to get by? Late in 1939, Erwin Hasen joined Chesler's staff. Hasen was just beginning to work professionally in art and, at 21, was still living with his parents, who had a furniture business go bankrupt and were rock-skipping from apartment to apartment in Manhattan to avoid going under. Hasten was an all-around artsy fellow who could have passed for Mickey Rooney's more effervescent, smaller brother. He had taken some drawing classes at the National Academy of Design and the Art, Student League, Art Students League, but abandoned his first aspiration, fine art, as impractical. He had a good compositional sense and applied himself to his assignments for Chesler, among the first of which was a detective story about a counterfeiting ring published by Timely. Not long after Hasten stacked the pages and submitted them to his boss, Chesler walked over to his drawing table and told him, Good work, kid. That's a hell of a job you did. I'm going to play that up big. At the end of the day, as Hasten cleared up his materials, he realized that he had inadvertently given Chesler only the top page of the story he had done, all the sheets of drawing paper beneath, underneath it, were blank. <laughs> well, this hasn't happened before, but here we are, we're live, and we have no guest. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm going to just chat with you for just a minute, and I'm going to send a note to Mr. Haydu and uh, his publicist asking where they are. <laughs> Um, 
I hope you're all having a good uh, a good day. Um, <laughs> bear with me a second here. I want to uh, put this in. Um, this is fun, isn't it? If you're uh, if you're listening for the first time, by the way, we have a uh, a live web chat that goes along with this uh, interview. And I welcome your questions there. I, I'm sure that David will appear soon or let me know in some way uh, where he is. Um, but meanwhile, it's just us. <laughs> I have not had this happen before. You know, I, I was interested in David's book uh, for personal reasons. Um, uh, I did the biography of uh, Will Eisner, uh, Will Eisner's Spirited Life, uh, who, and Eisner is featured uh, quite prominently in David's book. Um, and uh, so I was, you know, I was very interested to see what David had to say about him, uh, and it was very interesting. Uh, it's one of the things I want to talk to him about is where Will Eisner fits into all this. Uh, certainly, he was not responsible for the great comic book scare by any means, but um, let's see. We have a call here. Let's see who this is. Um, Hello. Hi. It's David Haydu. Hey, David. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. How are you? I, <laughs> we had a miscommunication. I thought you were calling me. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. No, I'd, uh, I think if you ask Kathy, the instructions are pretty explicit about that, but I apologize if there was confusion. I apologize if I messed up. That's all right. Here we well, are. You, you missed a wonderful introduction and uh, me reading <laughs> me, me reading an excerpt from the book. Oh, and, is, well, why don't I hang up and just keep reading? I think that would be more interesting <laughs> than talking. <laughs> oh, no, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I have to tell you, this is, it's, it's hard to believe that we haven't spoken before and that we've never done this because, our, uh, because of our mutual passion for, for Will Eisner and his work. Uh, and it's a really a thrill to be talking to you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, I know uh, I know that you were uh, well acquainted with Will, as was I. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I remember uh, it was funny. I was with, working with Will in the, the biography the last, basically, the last two and a half or so years of his life. And it was amazing to me after he passed. I mean, it was great the appreciation of him, but what really uh, astonished me the most was how many other things he was working on uh, mm-hmm. that I had no idea about, mm-hmm. and I was supposed to be pretty in tune with what he was mm-hmm. doing. Mm-hmm. So uh, tell me, uh, let, let's start I remember, with Will. Can I ask you a question? Do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure. I, when yeah. I, I remember uh, right around the turn, around 2000 or 2001 or something, or maybe a little bit after that, that Will was originally thinking of doing a, a memoir. And and, and co- co- collaborating with you on a memoir. What happened to that? No, no idea. <laughs> well, that's funny. I, let's try not to make this too much about me, but I will tell you. Um, just, you're more interesting than me. I had, uh, you're Mr. Media. I'm not Mr. Anything. <laughs> to be Mr. <laughs> Mr. Something is a big deal. I'm just, well, just a guy. I, I, can, I can answer, this, I can answer the, the story, though. It's, uh, ironically, uh, for me, uh, something happened in Orlando, and I'm, ha- I'm heading to Orlando today. But um, I had met with uh, Will, and uh, I-, I knew that he was he had been interested. Actually, I don't think he was terribly interested in writing uh, an autobiography or a memoir so much as uh, his agents, uh, Dennis Kitchen and Judy mm-hmm. Hansen, were interested in having him do that. And uh, we were introduced, and we hit it off pretty well. Um, I think I was geographically desirable. I think he also liked that. Um, I had a straight journalism background and was not coming at it uh, as a fanboy. And I, I, I know that, mm-hmm. that you know you have a similar, uh, right. d- similar in the sense uh, mm-hmm. background that you know straight journalism. Mm-hmm. So uh, we got started on it, and we spent. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with being a fanboy. No, no, not at all. No, <laughs> gotta love them, and occasionally they even bathe. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, we went about two or three months, and I worked up a proposal. It was very detailed, and I sent it to him. And I remembered I was very excited, and, and, mm-hmm. and Dennis and Judy were very excited. And uh, I remember this. I, I went to Orlando, and I'm, dr- I'm in Orlando, and I get this call from Will, and I thought, okay, this is it. And I pull off to the side of the road, and he says, listen, I'm not going to be able to do this. And I said, what? 
what do you mean? I mean, I just poured my heart into this. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, well, he says, I'm reading through the proposal, and you did a good job, but my gosh, this is going to be a lot of work. Mm-hmm. He says, I, I, I would have to make a decision to either write my, my autobiography or, or write all the other, do all the other stuff that I'm doing. He mm-hmm. says, I can't, there's no way I can do both. Mm-hmm. He said, so I'm afraid I can't do this. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, my God, and I was just... I was crestfallen, mm-hmm. and I said, well, what, you know, is there any way I can change your mind, or what can we do? He said, I'm perfectly happy to make you my uh, authorized biographer. You take all the money. <laughs> that was a joke, but you take all the money. Yeah, that, that, and, that, are you talking uh, about Will Eisner? Yeah, no, <laughs> I know. That was, that was weird, too. He mm-hmm. says, and, and I'll, cooperate, I'll cooperate with you fully. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give you access to everyone and everything that you need, mm-hmm. and... Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why it, it became a biography as opposed to a, a mm-hmm. memoir. Mm-hmm. You know, part, well, part of Will's genius was that he was so not only just comfortable uh, with both business and art, but a, a savvy in business and uh, as well as gifted as an artist. And the, 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 you know, that ability, you know this better than anybody, just for the, for the sake of stimulating a, a discussion, um, the the fact that he was so skillful and comfortable with business and uh, was what granted him the kind of legal authorship uh, in the 1940s. It was utterly uh, u- unique, and that uh, that then st- stirred him to. Kind of, well, I wouldn't even say it stirred him because he was a man with kind of high uh, aesthetic ideals all along. But it was of a piece with him, with kind of with with the notion of creative authorship that was denied so many other people at the time, so many uh, comics artists at the time. So you know, I mean, through his savviness and his comfort with business, he made sure that he owned the the spirit. So he, you know, that he that he owned that property, uh, and th- that I I, th- I think is in, is inseparable from his. Uh, the commitment to it and his devotion to it, both cr- it creatively. Mm. So, and you know, people often marvel at what you know why, <clears throat> why what was it about uh, what was it about you know Eisner that you know separated him from the pack? Well, you know, there were, there were great uh, many things, and one of course was his supreme <laughs> uh, gifts as a storyteller and as a, and as an artist and as a creative imagination, his ability to work with others and his ability to collaborate with others and to bring out the best in his collaborators and to <coughs> to empower collaborators to fulfill uh, the, the individual vision that he had and a unique vision as, as, a, as a graphic storyteller. But it was also that he could take care of business. Uh, and that was a stumbling block for a lot of other people in the, in a, a, who were working in that medium in the 30s and 40s. That they were kind of uh, uh, victims of the bosses to kind of significant degrees. They had many had the enthusiasm for comics, and others had didn't, uh, uh, more, many others who didn't even have the enthusiasm had the had a, had talent, had a, had ability as as artists and create and a creative creative flair, but were Kind of slaves to the bosses, uh, in a way that Will never was, because he was a boss. He was the boss. But anyway, now we're going off on Will. But <laughs> that's all right. What, what else do you want to talk about? Well, before we finish that thought, I will say I think there was a parallel. There's a, an odd parallel, and this parallels some of your work, I think, in mm-hmm. in what you've written about. In that, uh, Will, uh, in the in the 40s, a lot of the creators in comics were, were mm-hmm. Jewish. Mm-hmm. And were were taken advantage of. They lost mm-hmm. their rights. They they didn't make any real money off of what they did. And mm-hmm. I, in my mind, that parallels in the 50s and, and early 60s what happened to a lot of black or African American uh, musicians who also were taken advantage of. Did some phenomenal work, and uh, and and lost you know lost their rights. And the the, the thing is, of course, as you say, mm-hmm. Will was a great businessman. I mean, he. Right understood the value of what he created and maintained those rights. Right. Uh, I think one right. Of the right. Yeah, I think yeah. that's I think I think that's that's true, but you know, the musicians who are working in uh, vernacular modes of expression, who are working in 
uh, folk modes. I think you're alluding to, to blues musicians primarily, yeah. but also there were uh, bluegrass, well, not <clears throat> so much bluegrass, well, bluegrass musicians by the 50s, but uh, musicians in other uh, rural veins uh, of music who weren't working in the com- in the commercial sphere, who weren't working for uh, corporate entities for companies that didn't have to, who were working apart from the corporate structure, who were able to create and uh, function uh, in a, in a, in a cre- creatively in a way that, a uh, significant way, but apart from the corporate structure. So these pe- you know, people are in, uh, in uh, rural communities, or they're, or they're working in uh, clubs or to audiences where record sales and national are, are, are not you know, central to, to, to don't define their success or aren't like the measure of success. So they're able uh, to survive and, uh, and create. But what happened uh, in many cases is once that uh, music was a uh, found a larger audience, and now was now once the corporate entities, the record companies, discovered that music and enabled it to find a larger audience. Those those corporate entities, the big record companies, uh, and made made sure uh, to keep the biggest pieces of the most pieces of the pie for themselves. Uh, and that's when these creative folks that we're talking about in, in, in blues and in country music really suffered. But this came a little after some time in the process for them. So they're able to make they're able to make their work. They're able to make creative work, and it's interesting, original work, and it turns out to be influential work. The, so the difference in the part of some of the uh, comic book artists of the 30s and 40s is that they're always working for for companies even and even though they're small companies um, and even though they're independent companies and not the not the major publishing companies it's not you know Simon and Schuster it's not even it's not Time Inc it's small companies there's still a, a, you know a corporate structure there's still bosses and there's still publishers and they're still thinking of themselves as you know as as workers <laughs> Yeah. Are not as artists, and in fact, many of them take a kind of pride in not being athletes or being artists, but in being in in su- succeeding in uh, as as workers, and uh, they see kind of an honor in that. In many cases, because they came out of uh, the tenements or came from working class families, and in many cases, even in Will's case, is one example. And there are many, count, I mean, dozens and dozens of others that I know of from the interviews I did for my book of people who came from not just struggling families, but kind of dysfunctional families, and and fa- uh, were products of failed fathers in many cases. Uh, so the idea that okay. Now I'm the, as Will used to say, you became the breadwinner at a young age, and how many, how many, how many other times we've heard? I've heard that same story from so many other comic artists. That uh, they took a sense of a sense of pride in that, and that was both a, but the driver, but it was kind of inhibiting and kind of limiting creatively, because they're just doing work that is, you know, uh, serving the bosses. Doing, they're fulfilling, doing their job, uh, and not necessarily always stretching and being as creative as they might be if they're functioning in another, in another time, in another, you know, in another way. I don't know. Am I getting too a- academic? You know, I, I, I teach at Columbia. So, yeah, you're entitled to be academic. You know, so sometimes I get, <laughs> you know, I'm inclined to get a little theoretical about these things. I'm sorry. That's all right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's let's do this. Um, let me give out our phone number, and then let's turn our attention uh, back to your new book. Um, if uh, if you'd like to call in and ask a question uh, live of uh, David Haydu, author of The Ten Cent Plague, The Great Comic Book Scare and How It Changed America, uh, give us a call, uh, 646-595-3135. That is a toll call, but damn it, it's worth it. But remember, <laughs> only call us if you're listening live today, May 16th. Okay, 2008. If this is 2015, who knows? We're you know we're not available at the moment. Um, so David, 
yeah. tell us from your book, tell us about this terrible scourge that was mm. upon this fine land. Hmm. <clears throat> that terrible scourge that what? I just didn't hear what you said. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this oh, fine land. Terrible fine land. scourge. That, yeah. That's my, that's my Woody Guthrie. Yeah. That's very good. Well, it depends on what... There are two scourges, depending on your point of view. All right. If you were a parent in the 1940s and saw your kids engaging in all kinds of behavior that you don't consider acceptable or not acceptable in your in your time and uh you you found those kids reading comics and you made the connection that oh the comics must be the cause of all this bad behavior then the comics are the scourge the comics mm-hmm. are the plague and that's one of the like, the two meanings of the the title of my book, The Ten Cent Plague, one is that uh, the, the, the parents and the pre-war generation and the institutions of authority, the government, the, the uh, churches, the PTAs, the schools, and all the other institutions of, uh, as I said, of authority of the, of the time saw comics as a plague. But then what happened, uh, they saw comics as a you know, it's a contagion. It's something that was insidious. It was infecting young people, and you know. Uh, and then what happened was they acted on this. <clears throat> uh, tried to, you know, here, if this contagion is running wild, well, my goodness, something has to be done about it. Uh, and <clears throat> all those institutions uh, took serious action to to try to snuff out comics. Uh, and the, I mean, very dramatic action, and the, over a period of a long from the from the mid 1940s up until the 1950s, there were uh, community uh, or, organized protests and communities all around the country. There were acts of legislation in cities and states. It started in 1948. By the, if we were talking 60 years ago today, there were already be about 50 pieces of legislation in cities all around the country restricting the sale of comics or outlawing the sale of comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, there were uh, sermons against comics in churches all around the country and then soon uh, public burnings of comics and bonfires in towns and cities all around the country. And this is, this, this, this debate this over comics turned into a historical what started out as a debate turned into a full-blown hysteria, and it captured the the country. And the whole country basically went crazy for a period uh, over this issue of comics, which was never the debate was never really about comics. It was really always about what comics seemed to represent, both to parents and to kids, mm-hmm. uh, which was a you know, different uh, sensibility, different set of values, a different way of thinking, a different way of acting. Uh, so the, 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 the end of the story is, uh, the end of my book, it, if I talk about this, nobody's going to buy the book, and you're a businessman, you know how bad that is for business, but I'll do it anyway. The, well, uh, you know, no, you that's, okay. Go. that's okay. The, um, the, by the early 1950s, the hysteria over comics reached the like, oh, the proportions that are all, all, all unthinkable, uh, uh, unimaginable if we, th- if we thought about them t- today. Boy, that's terrible grammar. Very dr- dramatic proportions. With uh, not just public, not just public burnings, but over a hundred acts of legislation now in cities all around the country. Finally, uh, the Senate uh, took up the cause, and it became. Uh, a parallel counterpart of a piece with the paranoia of the McCarthy era, uh, and it was a clampdown on comics, utterly comparable to the clampdown on uh, the, the supposed co- communist in, uh, influence in the film industry uh, during the days of the Hollywood blacklist. And the comic book industry, the comic book business, practically was practically snuffed out of existence in the early 1950s. And for comic book artists and writers who were working at the time, and there were, you know, there were hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of them, this this clampdown this was a plague to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carmen Infantino uh, said to me, and that exact line, used that exact language to me, among the many people I interviewed for the book. He said it was like the plague. You couldn't get work. Uh, to be someone else said to be a comic book artist was like 
to say you're a comic book artist was like, maybe Carmen did this say, you know, I can't remember. Uh, Will said something very, very, so actually used the same language uh, at one point said to be a comic book artist is like saying you're a child molester. I think Carmen said the same thing and maybe a couple of others. Uh, it, you know, it was to not just be kind of low in the the, the social uh, rung or in the hierarchy of the arts, but it was to be something something evil, something that was it, something that was really that was doing damage to the country. Well, so that's I, the I, idea. I of, there I you go. Saying, Will 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 used to say that the uh, 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 being uh, working in comic books was considered below being a pornographer by some people. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, what? Um, mm-hmm. That's right. At least porno- you know, por- pornography uh, was a victim. Well, it's not a victim necessarily. Well, you could argue that it's a victimless, a victimless. Well, you know, let's not get into pornography. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this: um, uh, there was a lot of stuff happening in this country following, mm-hmm. during, and following World War II, because so much was changing. There was this onslaught mm-hmm. of. What then we would have called new media. Now we call it new media for a different reason. Uh, people were uh, things that were only in the big cities were getting out to uh, mm-hmm. the suburbs, the mm-hmm. sticks, everywhere. Uh, it mm-hmm. was it was there was uh, blues, there was rock and roll, there was comic books, uh, movies were widespread, uh, radio, radio, television. It was all happening at once. Mm-hmm. Um, what was comic books? Uh, it was just. Mm-hmm. One element of that, or was it? You know, I, I never got the sense. That's a very good question. Years, yeah, and it, no, there was there, there were. I, I would. I was, you're you're right that there was this this barrage. All, all these elements came in. All uh, were an enormous influence on the culture in the post-war years and shattered the way. Uh, Shattered the provincialism uh, that was common in the pre-war years. Uh, yeah, the, the people are now like face to face with different uh, modes of, of of thinking and of and of acting and different cultures. You now the white white folks are confronted with the black world in a way they hadn't uh, been before, and uh, uh, you know oldsters are confronted with the you know the young uh, sensibility in a way they hadn't been before. But I, if you really parse it out. It's not all like like in a barrage. It's not like there's this wave of all these things, you know, splashing on the shore at the same time. There was a there's neither. On the other hand, is there a neat sequence <laughs> where you know first it was A, then it was B, then it was C. But there there's a sloppy sequence, uh, and there's you know there's spilling there's spilling over, and there's but when you really, but if you really examine the, the, set, the set of events and look at the documentary evidence of what of what happened when, um, you find that comics were actually um, uh, introduced the sensibility that we associate with rock and roll before rock and roll, uh, before the 1950s, even before Rocket 80, Ike, Ike Turner's Rocket 88, Rocket 88, in the right. mid. But mid 1940s, we have crime does not pay and the rise of uh, during the wars. Even the, the post-war era really began <laughs> the tail end of the war years, uh, and culturally, uh, in terms of the inf- what's going on with youth culture in this country. Uh, so we have we find in in comic books uh, the kind of bad boy bad girl ethos and absorption with all kinds of bad behavior. Uh, uh, absorption with with, with with sex and and with and with violence that's uh, robust, overt, and sometimes even excessive. Mm-hmm. Uh, before you start finding the same things in the 1953, 54, 55 uh, in rock and roll. I mean, almost a good ten years before, but at least you know, at least six, seven, eight years ago, depending on how you measure. Uh, now blues. Of course, uh, uh, started earlier. The difference here, however, uh, is that you know, Robert Johnson uh, reached a different an audience of a different size than Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra. Uh, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra were 
mainstream mass entertainment, which is what comics were. <laughs> And by, by the late 1940s, early 50s, comics were the most popular form of entertainment in the country. So they're not, they're not a niche thing, and they're not something that appeals to you know, a rarefied audience or, 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 or an elite. And I consider the blues audience of the 1930s an elite. I consider, consider that, that even though they're not a moneyed elite, they're, they're, right. they're still an elite. Uh, and Comics were not the case. I mean, every kid, every young person was reading comics, and more people were reading comics than were see, seeing TV or watching movies or doing anything else. They were a, this enormous influence, and what they were communicating and what they were, what was expre- what was on those pages was radical, an enormous, uh, uh, immeasurable influence on the people who were reading it, who were mostly young people. So, young people, this stuff was being made by people who were fairly young for. A, a, other people who were really young, marketed directly to them, priced directly to them, uh, and an influence mainly on them. Uh, and that's the, the, these are significant ways in which what was going on in comics was different from you know what was going what happened earlier in blues in terms of the, the scale of the influence of comics, and in terms of what happened uh, with rock and roll can, in, because comics came first. So anyway, it's it's really interesting to to, to parse the, the, these these things out, and that's one of the big goals of my book was to, was to do that. And uh, you know, it was it's a, it's awkward. I don't know, sound, you know, I, I think I'd like to think that the book is, is a little bit of a corrective, maybe more than a little bit of a, of a corrective. And I really tried to re. I think the book. I hope that I'd like to think that the book repositions a lot of what we think of. As the roots of post-war, the post-war way of thinking, the post-war sensibility in a, in a set of events that preceded rock and roll. That's what it was like. As much as the book is a thesis book, that's the thesis. But it's it's only partly a thesis book, and it's largely is a narrative. It's largely a story. So anyway, there, does that have a long-winded answer to a simple question? <laughs> it's a good answer. It's a good answer. Okay. Uh, the uh... You know, it's it, as we look back, as we often do on, on periods of time where there's been uh, cultural unrest or mm-hmm. uh, social uh, uh, issues like this, you know, we look back and we think, oh, those people were so stupid or they were so naive. But mm-hmm. I, my perspective has changed a little over the years. Uh, you know, in the, in the 1970s, when I was reading a lot of comics, I mean, I was reading everything that was published and started reading a little uh, history you know, I'd read about uh, Dr. Frederick Wortham, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, he was he was certainly considered the major boogeyman of mm-hmm. the of the comics industry. Mm-hmm. And then what I found one of the things I found interesting in your book is that you 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 single him out, but you also go beyond him, yeah. and you talked about all the church influence that preceded him and the things that happened with him. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of I was kind of curious, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it, has he been? Um, has he taken too much heat in his in comics history for being responsible for all this? Uh, he's had to take on. He's. I think he's. He's. Uh, it's. It's too easy to reduce a very a, a, a very complex uh, debate uh, into the workings of any one in, in individual. And in the case of Wortham, he came fairly late in the process. I mean, he uh, he appears in Time Magazine and, and the Ladies Home Journal um, in 1948. And as we were saying earlier, and that's when he starts talk, talking in a significant way about the effect of uh, of comic books on on youth. Uh, by 1948, as I said earlier, there, were already, there, was, there was already legislation in the works all over the country in comics, and there were, there were, article, there were major articles in uh, national publications uh, as well as in the, uh, church circles uh, about the horrors of comics for, since 1940, 1941, for some time now. Uh, the the link between comics and juvenile delinquency, delinquency uh, had had already been in, uh, a claim to a link between the two of them had or, had already been in print by by, by a, a, a Jesuit writer named uh, Robert Southard, who was an uh, and Southard was was only one of a 
string of people who, for one reason or another, uh, saw something to be concerned about. What am I whistling on the phone? I'm sorry. No. In, You're in fine. Comics, You're fine. In comics. Uh, now, uh, uh, Wortham, Wortham uh, was a man. It was a social idealist, uh, a s- smart person who had done a lot of good work <laughs> in other realms. Uh, he wasn't uh, incompetent. Uh, he he wasn't uh, a, a, a maniac. Uh, he came when he came to comics. He was looking for answers to what he recognized and others recognized as a pretty significant issue. He saw it as a problem, but let's call it an issue, uh, which is that uh, young people were changing, and they were. Uh, he's a he was a, a, a clinical psychiatrist, and these words are. I, we, should, we could spend some time descri- discussing exactly what that means. Clinical work means he's working in clinics, he's, 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 and a psychiatrist means he's a, he's a, he's a doctor. He's practicing. Uh, he's doing diagno- he, His method is diagnostic. He's not a social scientist. So he and he didn't use the the, the methods of social scientists of sociologists. So his work in comics is very controversial and uh, in many ways dubious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, now, you know, it sounds, yeah, I, I don't know. If I'm getting a little dry and, and about, about <laughs> this, you know, it's. I think I'm. I'm trying to handle the issue of Wortham delicately because I think he deserves to be handled delicately. It's just too easy to say, oh, there was this big bad guy. Now that that said. I mean, his book did a lot. His work on comics uh, did a lot of harm, and a lot of it was wrong. Now, I think there's a difference between calling it wrong-headed and wrong. I don't think mm-hmm. he was necessarily wrong-headed, but the work was wrong, and he made he made sweeping, damning claims. He called com- he said comic book artists were worse than Hitler. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, he 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 mm-hmm. very much like uh, McCarthy went. Beyond, mm-hmm. there, there was a, there was a there was a strand there when he started, which uh, a lot of uh, people who might disagree on other things might have agreed upon. But mm-hmm. when 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 guys like that start you know piling on, mm-hmm. it, it it becomes crazy. I wanted to say mm-hmm. uh, I'm looking at the book. I'm on uh, page 99. This was this is part of what I found interesting about your your research on mm-hmm. Wortham was you point out that. Uh, he was deeply empathetic to the uh, the Negro condition. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's always amazing to be, mm-hmm. to be using that word again. But, well, that w- I used uh, the words of the, to- the, 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 the time. The work of history. I used the work of, word of the yeah. time. Yeah. Well, you point out that he had become friendly with uh, Richard Wright and mm-hmm. uh, Ralph Ellison. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was very interesting. But there's a great um, thing here. You were talking about him being a uh, clinical um, mm-hmm. uh, psychiatrist. Uh, Psychologist, mm-hmm. and this is great. You say Wortham was unequivocal about his conclusions uh, dealing with children in these in, in this uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, clinic. He says uh, we found that comic book reading was a distinct influencing factor in the case of every single every single delinquent or disturbed child we studied, and that factor must be curbed as it steadily increases. Comic books, he said, echoing the language of Anthony Comstock, were quote. In, in intent and effect, demoralizing the morals of youth. Um, that's, a, I mean, that's, you know, if you're mm-hmm. a parent, which, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I am now, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the kind of thing that makes you go, hmm. Mm-hmm. And, so, mm-hmm. and when I ask you about that, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. that's what I was saying before. My perspective over 30 mm-hmm. years has changed mm-hmm. dramatically in that uh, in the 70s when I'd hear about Wortham, I'd think, oh, bad guy. You know, mm-hmm. like, there's mm-hmm. good and there's bad, and he's the mm-hmm. guy wearing the black hat. Mm-hmm. But right. now as a parent, and I'm not saying anything good about him either, mm-hmm. but as a parent, when I, I hear people point out that Grand Theft Auto, for example, the mm-hmm. video game, is very, mm-hmm. uh, it's very nasty and it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it has bad, poor depictions of women and, uh-huh. and, and races and all kinds of stuff like that, um, sexuality, um, I do, give, I, I do mm-hmm. have pause and mm-hmm. think about it a little mm-hmm. more than I did before I was a parent. Mm-hmm. My question to you is, mm-hmm. do you think many of the people who were pushing against comic books in, in, the, in the 50s, in the mm-hmm. late 40s, did, were, they, were they driven by an honest sense that these were really bad? Or 
you know, were they way over the top just trying to destroy mm-hmm. anything that gave people pleasure? I think both. I think I, 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 I can't have it both. I mean, you can't think about comics and consider comics important and uh, have and take seriously what the comic books expressed in the late 1940s during this period when they were very pulpish and dark and noirish and discount the claims that people like Wortham and not only Wortham made the comic books had an effect on the readers that's hypocritical <laughs> you can't on one hand say oh no they 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 really mattered and then say in the next breath oh they didn't matter they're only comics mm. no no what they no they they were they were uh expressing ideas uh and and values uh, and a challenge to the to the to the status quo in many ways, and they did. They were and many of them were absorbed with with violence and with, and some of them were extreme. There is no question. And uh, the, what was the effect of that? I mean, I think that there were effects. I think some of those. I think those effects are very significant. I think that those effects go a long way. Those, I think we're looking, we're living with those effects. And I think com- the, uh, an understanding of comics goes a long way to explaining, uh, the, it's not rhetorically accurate, I didn't say that right, but uh, comics, what comics did uh, ex- influenced the world around us t- today. Uh, now, that's not all laudable, but I think there's a danger in looking at things in kind of black and white, good, bad terms. Uh, in, in many ways, the, the presence of evil, the presence of crime, the presence of, of horrors, even the presence of unspeakable horrors in comics performs a function, and there's a value to In many ways, there's a value to that. Uh, you know, the St. Augustine talked about the the necessity of, if we don't see evil and the, the 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 see the face of evil, we don't understand the the the, the imperative of of good, you know. Mm-hmm. We, uh, and for young people who are trying to come to terms with the adult world and trying to come to terms with good and bad and confronting a world of that, that's surrounded by horrors and in the 19, late 1940s or in the right after the war and during the the, the rise of the nuclear uh, of the atomic bomb, they're confronting the reality of unspeakable horrors all around them. So, in a way, comics are a release valve. They're an escape hatch. They're a way to face the existence, the, the presence, and the existence of evil. So, there's a value there. Now, does that deny the fact that sometimes uh, a romanticization or a glorification of of evil has an effect? Of a problematic effect on the reader? No, I think it does. And does the treatment of of violence as play does that ignore us to violence? Do we do we get numbed to to, to violence by just kind of a, its constant presence and its depiction in extreme ways? I think we can. I think we can. And I I, I think in in some ways the. the, the, the the extremity of the extremity, extremity, the extremeness, extremeness of comics is can is defensible. In other ways, it's not. And if I see, I don't mean to be. I'm, what I'm really trying to communicate is the complexity of this issue, and I, I really think it needs to be seen this way. Well, I I have three kids myself now. One is five, and uh, one is twenty five. Go figure that. <laughs> But, you know, I cannot go to the hostile movies or the Saw movies. I cannot bear those movies. Mm. Like, you know, and, you know, I've had, I have no people who have been the victims of atrocities. And, I, you know, that the, the horrible things happen, and we, we really should not grow in order to them as a culture. And I think we are. And I think that one of the reasons, and I don't mean to stand on a soapbox, but I want to make a point, that, that I think that one of the reasons that Abu Ghraib happened and that uh, Guantanamo Bay, Bay uh, goes on and that so many, so many of us kind of take it with a shrug. Oh, oh, there's, you know, oh, there's, you know, 
is they're subjecting people to like torture with like electric wires and like the de- terrible acts of de- dehumanization and uh, you know just uh, you know uh, it, subjecting people to unspeakably vile conditions and we shrug our shoulders and we think oh well that that goes on all the time well where do we get the idea that that goes on all the time where does that go on all the time it goes on all the time in film <laughs> It goes on all the yeah. time in popular culture, but it really doesn't go all go on all the time in in the world. But this perception that gee, that it does and it's all okay comes in part from the violence in popular entertainment. And to whatever degree the har- the horrors of comics of the '40s or '50s led to this, I think is should is a problem. And in, mm-hmm. in to that degree, you know, Wortham was right. You know, but it's the, but the whole but this whole issue doesn't boil down to that. And as I feel even letting that come out of my mouth, you know, I really need yeah, you really need to say, but hold on, listen to me for twenty minutes because <laughs> right. you know he was right in a way, he's wrong in other ways, and this is complicated. That's why the well, book is that's why the book yeah. is you're not twenty pages; it's over four hundred. Right, and that, that, I mean that was kind of my point in, in raising the issue as well is that. It's not cut and dried the way I thought it was when I was much younger. It's, mm-hmm. It is complicated because mm-hmm. as a parent, you have to look out for these things. And, and it's the parents who are not looking out for, for the kids who mm-hmm. – the kid, you know, like if my, if my daughter reads something uh, that's, that you know, is violent, or she's going to talk to me about it, and we're going to talk it through. But I know that's not the case in every family. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's perspective that you bring to something. Um, mm-hmm. Let's go back. Mm-hmm. We, we've How old are your kids, Bob? I've got one. She's 11. Oh, is she an 11 year old girl? Yeah. I just want to say, as someone who's raised a girl who's now 21, my heart goes out to you. Enjoy 11. <laughs> <laughs> you have about another. You have about another two years. Oh, every day, every day scares me. <laughs> well, um, enjoy her while you have her. Thank you. Thank you. I will. What? Uh, how did you get started on this? My, my, and the reason I ask is, uh, I know that you were talking to Will uh, before I was, and Will Eisner, that is. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm wondering if if uh, if any of this came out of that because he 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 plays a a larger role in the book than I would have imagined mm-hmm, in terms mm-hmm. of uh, guiding mm-hmm. the narrative. Mm-hmm. But I'm kind of wondering how did you how did you hit on this theme and this story? Where where did that come from? Well. Uh, I w- loved comics when I was a kid. I used to draw. When uh, hmm. the first work that I had published were, was was illustrations. It wasn't uh, it wasn't journalism. In my home local paper, the Eastern Express, I was an illustrator for the Eastern Express when I was still in high school. Hmm. If we met, I mean, if, it, if you and I, I don't know why we would ever go back to this town in New Jersey where I grew up. Actually, it's a neat little town. But if we went back and we saw anybody who hadn't seen me in all those years, they would say, "Oh, Dave, oh, oh, Dave, uh, how's the art?" You know? <laughs> oh, you know? I'd say I became a writer. What? They said what? So, I, well, art was always important to me. And my favorite, the style I loved best was cartooning. So this was always something and this. It, dear to me the subject was something dear to me um but that said i don't write my books and i've only done three books and you know i'm not a, you know i'm over 40 now and i don't i've never written about i've used i've tapped my passions but i don't write about me or something only because I, I i love it otherwise i'd be writing books about you know you know, uh, strawberry rhubarb pie, uh, <laughs> or ice cream. You know, some of my favorite things. I, I I started looking into this set of events as a thinking that there might be a magazine piece on the anniversary of you know the to do over comics, and I was stunned. I was absolutely stunned when as I started doing the research to find that it was so much bigger a story than I that I ever realized, and that it had. The consequences that it had, that that comic book, I didn't even re- I didn't realize myself going in that I would f- I, w- I, w- I would find a story that with the drama and the sweep of this story, nor that nor would I find that com- comic books answered so many questions I had about the 
the world we live in. And I really, I really think this book. I really like to think that this book answers a lot of questions about God. How did we? How do? We, how do we get where we are? Uh, so it's a bit of a butterfly. You know, I think there's. I think the book is. I use the cliche of the butterfly effect. I do think that these comics of the of the, of the 1940s, and early 1950s, explain a lot of, of of what we find all around us in popular culture. Uh, and it, I, it, because I used to draw, and I still do as an avocation, it was fun for me to you know interview. Well, there was a there was one point when I was down there around two, the spring of 2001. Sh- even before my last book was published, because you know this is what, as well as I do, there's a period between finishing one book and seeing it uh, oh, yeah. in, the, in the bookstores when you have like a year. So <laughs> I was working on this this book for a good year before my last book was published, which was in the spring of 2001. So I was working on this already before that. And I remember going down there and you know, oh, I'm able to. Will I was able to ask Will for some tips, some drawing tips, and the two of us sat and remember that you know, the set of drawing tables he had in his studio. Oh yeah, yeah. We, and there was a whole. And for those who were listening and weren't there, which is most people who are listening, for, there was a whole wall. He had like a long ta- uh There was, you know, there was room for more than one person to sit and draw, uh, and I was able to to sit and draw with them and. So that came out of kind of my own experience. Anyway, there's another long-winded answer. You have to ask me yes. From now on, I recommend <laughs> yes and no questions. That's the here's, the, here's the thing, David. When I, when I started doing the, the podcast, uh, I realized that uh, the way to make it easy on me was to ask questions that you could not possibly answer yes or no. And <laughs> that way, I get to sit back. Of course, it's changed now. I don't know if you have the if you're using the, if you if you have the webcast. Oh, I love the web. Yeah. No, but we have the webcast that goes with the uh, this interview, and now the Blog Talk Radio has added video, uh, so you can see the host uh, with video while the interview is going on. So I can't look away, and <laughs> so it, it keeps me involved. As a matter of fact, I'm oh, we should have used Skype, and we could have done the two up, of us. Or I'm holding up your book right now on the video. For hey, the what's webcast. the URL? I'm going to look it up. Oh, I'll, I'll, I've sent it to uh, me. Yeah, it's blogtalkradio.com/slash/mrmedia. Mm-hmm. Great. But, um, you know, you had a colleague of mine on named uh, Sri Srinivasan. Oh, he's a great guy. I've known him for a while now. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, he's a colleague of mine at Columbia. Uh, he has the latest gadget that was invented like that morning. Sri has. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll go down and get some advice. I want to, I want to check out the podcast. He's, uh, he's a great guy. We had him on, and he was talking about uh, the uh, using LinkedIn and Facebook and things mm-hmm. to better advantage and he was a great guy. Um, well, let me ask you this, because we're, we're going to wind up. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes left. Okay. Um, I'm kind of thinking that your, your friends who know you best, not from your cartooning days mm-hmm. back in New Jersey, but mm-hmm. from the New Republic and your books on uh, Billy mm-hmm. Strayhorn mm-hmm. And, and Bob Dylan and Joan mm-hmm. Baez, they must have been a little surprised by your choice of topic this time. Well, I've been writing uh, magazine pieces about comics for a while, so I've done a few for the New York Review of Books. In fact, I did a big piece about Will for the New York Review mm-hmm. six or seven years ago, and I've done pieces on Daniel Klaus and Joe Sacco also for the New York Review, and a bunch of pieces for the Times, and for did a piece about Marjan Satrapi for Book Forum. So I've been writing as a journalist and as a critic about comics too, and it's it's odd how many people have this double. You know, over the, the, there was a there was a jazz writer named Martin Williams who also wrote about uh, comics, and I keep bumping into people from who I've known. Well, I keep in, you know finding that people who I've known only in, in music also have a passion for comics, and I really maybe maybe some listeners uh, would have a reason, an explanation for this. I don't myself, except that the. At least jazz. Will used to talk a lot about jazz, and he saw a lot of commonality between jazz and comics. And mm-hmm. uh, so, I mean, there, I mean, there's some parallels between jazz and comics, and maybe, maybe as expressions of kind of outsider identity, and uh, maybe I don't know. But I don't think I'm certainly not alone in having these dual passions. Uh, there were there were people whose eye raised their eyebrows because they didn't immediately they don't didn't and st- I think probably in many cases still don't think comic books are s- worthy of serious attention. I know that you know I get I get 
funny looks around the halls of Columbia when people hear that I oh, I just oh this is David Hayter who just wrote a book about comic books. I mean, I feel like Will like somebody could have said oh yes he just wrote a book about you know about about Marilyn Chamber about you know <laughs> Ginger Lynn you know right uh, and uh, it's it's. Uh, when in the world is that going to stop? For goodness, sake. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. By the way, I, I think those of us listening were very impressed that you were able to mention Marilyn Chambers and Ginger Lynn in the same sentence. <laughs> well, <clears throat> that, we'll have to save that for another conversation. Okay. I think. Well, it does show it does show my age. I have, you know, I guess those are at least references that the newest of which is probably twenty years old. Well, true. Uh, but once a classic, always a classic yeah, in guess, that in right, that world. Right. So let me ask you one more thing. It's not so much a question, but I understand uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks you're going uh, mano a mano with uh, another uh, comics uh, fiend, uh, uh, Stephen Colbert. Oh, yeah. I'm already nervous about that. Uh, yeah, I'm going on on the 11th, on June 11th. And uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've, I don't know what to expect, but I think I should... Uh, I don't know what to say. I'm ter- scared to death already. I'm going to start uh, ordering uh, Valium by uh, mail or something to kind of keep me calm uh, because I'm more, it's, what, a month away? And like, yeah. I'm already in a panic over it. But I'm very, grat- I'm very uh, honored and really and surprised that he's having me on. I would um, think that the best advice, and I haven't been on there, but my <laughs> best advice from watching the show would be to uh, read his own comic before you go in and be prepared to compliment him on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, my wife says you basically can't win, so you just right. go, go on and smile. So that's what I'm going to go. Go in prepared to lose. Exactly. I'm going to get one of those, get like an artificial a mouth a mouthpiece that just creates a smile so I don't have to... <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's my, that's my strategy. That could be interesting. Uh, yeah. So uh, there, there we have it. Um, well, uh, I'm glad to, I'm glad to have done this. You're great, and I, and uh, we're, I'm, <laughs> we should have done it. Uh, I'm glad that we're, we're doing it. We have, and we should get together again and talk about Will sometime. I was, I was going to say, you know, I have, I, I haven't announced this yet, but Michael uh, Uslan, who uh, had the uh, film rights to the Spirit and is a producer on the Spirit movie, is actually coming on the show uh, June 4th. And I, just thinking about it. What I need to do is maybe when we get to the fall is invite you and Michael and maybe Dennis Kitchen and some people on do like a, a panel discussion about Will and his legacy and oh, maybe just tell some old stories. You know, that would be great. Have you seen any of the footage? Uh, just uh, I've seen the trailer. That's uh-huh. about it. Yeah, that's what I but saw. Well, what do you think? Uh, uh, well, okay. I, I, I agree. I, you know, I yeah. agree. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about saying anything before I have Michael on. I don't want to scare him off. Okay. That, you know. <laughs> Seems like we're in assent on this. I think I think a lot of us are in agreement on that. We'll just uh, keep the door open and hopefully that the, the, the second trailer will show us That's a little more attitude. than actually resembles yeah, Will Eisner's spirit. That's uh, yeah. Well, it seems like it's closer than the TV made-for-TV movie was in the 70s. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Uh, well... David, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on Mr. Media. It was a pleasure to have you. This was great. It's, and you made it very easy, and I, I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And, okay. uh, you know, we'll have you back. Great. Good luck. Good luck Thanks with Colbert. Thanks. All right. I'll need it. I'll need it. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Take care. All right. You can find all of David Haydu's books, including The Ten Cent Plague, Lush Life, and Positively Fourth Street, available for sale on the Mr. Media site or Amazon.com. You can also catch up on what's new in David's career at his website, www.davidhaydu, that's D-A-V-I-D-H-A-J-D-U dot com. And for dozens more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main site, www.mrmedia.com. Yes, that's mrmedia.com, where you can listen to my conversations with the stars and creators of Army Wives, 24, The Big Bang Theory, Pearls Before Swine, Tell Me You Love Me, and many others. You can also read full transcriptions there. So please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Blueberry, Zencast, or iTunes. And folks, thanks for joining us today. Talk to you again real, talk to you again real, real soon. <laughs>